Good afternoon. I'm Jesse A. Applegate, named after my uncle Jesse. My father was Lindsay Applegate. Now, I was just a boy when my family went across on the Oregon Trail in 1843. When we arrived at the Dalles on the Columbia River, the men built boats to float down to get closer to the Willamette Valley, which was our destination. My brother and my cousin were in a boat that got caught up in a mighty whirlpool. They were pulled down, they both drowned, they couldn't even recover their bodies. So my father and my uncle said they vowed, we're gonna find a better way to get to the Willamette than down that river. So they, they uh, blazed a whole new trail from Idaho down through the California cutoff, then it went northwest through Klamath, and actually right up through our own Rogue River Valley here. If any of you have ever been on Riverside Avenue in Medford, you've been on the Applegate Trail. Mm -hmm. Then it continued on north from the old Hudson Bay Pack Trail. Now by then, there were thousands of immigrants pouring into this country. They were taking the Indians' lands, the Indians, well, for the most part, they had to go on reservations to keep from starving to death or being shot down. A few of them fought on to the bloody end, like Captain Jack of the Modocs. That's why my father proposed that a fort should be built out there in the Klamath area. Uh, and they called it, uh, to protect all the immigrants on the trail, they called it Fort Klamath. Then they built a wagon road from Jacksonville all the way to that fort to keep it in supplies, like from the Hanley Farm. Well... That road was hastily made, ill-planned, went from here through Butte Falls, around the side of Mount Pitt, if you could imagine that. So it was worthless in the winter snows, although it did manage to bring in the first sawmill to the Klamath Basin. But they abandoned the damn thing in two years, saw some civilian use up into the 1900s. Well, you know, since I'm already deceased and have nothing to lose, I'm not going to give my father and uncle all the credit for what was accomplished by the Applegates. No, you see, my father came from a family of nine children. I had 11 siblings. Uncle Jesse had 13 children. Uncle Charles had 15 children. If there's any monument, you know what? They ought to be made to all the Applegate women who <laughs> toiled endlessly and often without much recognition for all the work that they did to keep these families healthy and, and, and productive to the ladies. <laughs> I'm Louisa Wynn, and I'm so happy you're here today as I honor my son, Francis Welliver Wynn. He was one of the first young men from Southern Oregon to sign up for the Great War. Back in May of 1917, he enlisted with the United States Marine Corps and went back to Quantico, Virginia to join up with the 70th Company, 6th Regiment, the Fighting Marines. From there, from basic training, he would go to France to engage in mortal combat with his fellow Marines. The 6th Regiment showed such valor and courage on the battlefield, the French awarded them the War Cross Medal three times. But Francis never got his medals, nor did he ever see a battlefield in France. For in the deep of winter, during basic training, he caught the scarlet fever, and then pneumonia took him on January 13th, just weeks after his 19th birthday. My son, was the first young man from Jackson County to give his life in the Great War. But there was no special ceremony at his funeral, no recognition from the community for his service and his sacrifice. And I know that couldn't have been their true sentiment. That death came to him by pneumonia bacillus and not a bush bullet through the heart does not detract from the glory of his sacrifice one whit. From the glory of his sacrifice. That's what the Medford Mail Tribune said in a wonderful memorial they published weeks after he died. They put him on the roll of honor and I am grateful that the Mail Tribune reminded the community that they need to remember Francis. He was a fine young man. He grew up on our farm in uh, Weldon, just right outside of Eagle Point. 
he was a student at Medford Senior High School. And now he's buried here in this wonderful Jacksonville Cemetery. He's up the hill there in the Catholic section. And he would have liked to have been here today to make his acquaintance with all of you. But you see, he answered the call of duty one more time. And he's another Marine, God in the gates of heaven. I remember so well the excitement I felt when checking the newspaper daily for news that the U.S. Maritime Commission had set the launch dates for the SS Table Rock and the SS Jacksonville, two ships that would pay tribute to the Rogue Valley's notable history. After all, it would take me time to prepare and travel to Kaiser's Swan Island shipyard in Portland for the ceremony. You see, censorship codes during World War II required that the actual launch dates could not be revealed until six days before the ceremony took place. So I scanned that newspaper religiously. I was so honored to have been chosen to go and watch the SS Jacksonville, a tanker, off to battle. Oh, oh, excuse me, please. In my desire to tell you the story, I have failed to introduce myself. Well, my name is Claire Hanley, and my grandfather, Michael Hanley, raised his family on a farm not too far from here between Central Point and Jacksonville. It's called the Hanley Farm. You may know it. But did you know that this city of Jacksonville, this little city of Jacksonville, had a ship named after it? That's something special, isn't it? Oregon did play a part in world affairs, as those two tankers both took part in the Allied invasion in Normandy. We didn't know it at the time, but that was just eight weeks away. There were trucks, tanks, and warplanes that all needed massive amounts of fuel. So 481 tankers were to be built across the United States. We began an emergency shipbuilding program in 1942. 157 of those tankers were built right here in Oregon. The 41st and the 45th carried the names of Table Rock and Jacksonville across the Atlantic Ocean. The SS Table Rock was commissioned on November the 28th, 1943. County Judge Albert Powell and Mrs. Atlanta Parker Navziger it was her father who had first named those table rocks, attended the ceremonies. I attended the ceremonies for the SS Jacksonville a month later on November, December the 23rd. Oh, it was a moving and emotional moment, watching the ship slide down the way and set sail for the European theater of war. Both those tankers were part of the Merchant Marine fleet. They each carried a crew of 50, and cargo of 141,000 barrels of oil or gasoline. They cost about three million each to make and were typically ready for service in 82 days, which is less than three months. I am sad to have to tell you that after only eight months of service, a German U-boat that had been stalking a convoy of Allied tankers made a direct torpedo hit on the SS Jacksonville. This dreadful event took place about 50 miles north of Ireland. The ship was split in two by a massive fireball but refused to sink. She stayed afloat for another 15 hours before she went down, taking 48 crew members and 28 members of a naval armed guard detachment down with her. Of the ship's complement of 78, only two survived. The SS Table Rock lived a much longer life, being sold to France after the war, then Canada, and finally, in 1985, sold to Portugal for scrap. It was a tense and emotional time for our country and for its citizens. How everyone came together and what was accomplished in so little time 
speaks well of our past and of those who came before us. My married name. You might recognize it from Rap Road, south of here near Talent. My family name is Reams. I was born in Kentucky, same as my parents, Woodford and Mahalda Reams, and where my granddad traveled with Daniel Boone. We moved to Illinois for a while, and then in 1852, my folks hitched up the oxen team and brought our family out west. About a year or so after we arrived in Oregon, they filed a donation land claim, and we were on our way to 320 acres, about a mile past Phoenix. Quite an exciting life for a 10-year-old, I'd say. The trip west was difficult and dangerous. It wasn't long before the Indian Wars started. But we came through it and life went on. The Reams house still stands right down the hill next to the Beekman house. It was the home of my big brother, Thomas. When I was a little older, I met Ed Ackley. He was a sporting man. I'm pretty sure my parents didn't approve, but we eloped in 1860. Oh, we were married by a proper preacher the Reverend Moses Williams. I thought it was going to be a happy life, but things didn't work out so well, and I was soon back home with my family. Eventually, I married Joseph Rapp and settled down with him on the old Thornton place on Wagner Creek. Joseph was older. He had come west to California during the gold rush and was a successful miner there for years before heading north to farm in Oregon. Life wasn't always so easy. Our firstborn son, Edward, died in infancy. But thank the Lord, our son Fred was a healthy baby. He grew up to be an excellent farmer and lived on our farm his whole life. After my dear husband went to his reward in 1897, I moved in with my niece in Ashland. But I was called back to the farm in 1915 to help Fred when he and his wife went their separate ways. Hmm. He remarried a wonderful girl and they had three fine sons, Raymond, Joseph, and Chester. Chester still lives in Phoenix, near the old homestead. Our life was very full, and we had our share of success. When I look back on it, we were a true Oregon pioneer family. Hello, I'm Addie Marsh. And I want to tell you about my wonderful son, Denver. By the time he was 25 years old, he was a trolley motorman for the Rogue River Valley Railway. And the customers all loved him. Then when Mr. Spencer Bullis decided he wanted to lay some track up back of Jacksonville to haul some logs out of there, up by the watershed, well, of course, Denver was the first engineer of that steam locomotive. And our neighbor, Charlie Shrump, got a job there too. Well, one day, they were back up in the hills and uh, they had an engine and two log cars and it was just the least bit of an incline with the engine lower than the log cars. 
So when they asked Denver to move the train, Charlie, who was acting as fireman that day, jumped off, pulled the chucks from under the wheels, and then jumped back in the cab. Charlie moved the car, the train just the least bit, lined up that second car with a loading dock, and hit the air brake. But the air brakes didn't stop the train. And because it was on an incline, it just kept going faster and faster down the hill. And it was the train was supposed to go out on a trestle across a ravine. Well, those two heavy log cars, they just tipped over into the ravine. And that caused the locomotive to just smash into an embankment. Well, just before the crash, Denver pushed Charlie off of the train, and that saved his life. My Denver ended up under the wreckage. The logging crew dug him out, but it was too late. And Charlie, thanks to Denver, only suffered a broken leg and a few scrapes, and he got better real soon. My Denver was such a wonderful man. He died a real hero. He, they even wrote about him in the newspaper. What are you staring at? Oh, come to see Mrs. Marple, the gypsy. No, not that Miss Marple. I'm Mrs. Anna Marple. I was married to Ezekiel Marple in 1858 when I was 18. We settled on a 160-acre land claim up near Corvallis. Had our son Richard when I was 21. We called him Gus. Ezekiel and I divorced when I was 42. So I moved with Gus and his family to Lafayette. It's an even smaller town than Jacksonville. Now, Gus wasn't a hard worker like his father and always found himself on the sheriff's usual suspect list. And we were near destitute. Then I met David Corker, local merchant. Hard working, honest fella, not like Gus. And he was a little deaf. And unfortunately, because he was deaf, Gus thought he would be an easy man to rob. We were desperate. When Gus suggested we take some of David's money, I thought it would be okay. It was for the grandchildren. David was found hacked to death by an ax after his store had been ransacked. And when the sheriff came to our home, found break-in tools and a bloody shirt. So Gus and I were arrested. Gus was convicted of the murder and they released me due to lack of evidence. And then I had to prepare myself for my son's hanging three times. First time it was against Oregon law it was on a Sunday. Second time it was against Oregon law it was more than 60 days past conviction. The third hang date was set six months later, hanging to take place the temporary stockades next to the jail. But the sheriff botched the hanging, and the noose slipped. And I had to watch my boy swing for 18 minutes while he strangled to death. I cursed the town, I cursed them, saying they'd burn in hell for what they did to my boy. And next year I moved to Jacksonville to get away from the gossips. One good thing I can say the government did. By 1931, they abolished hangings in favor of lethal gas. Now go away and let me rest in peace! For Christmas in December 1918, members of the Catholic Order, the Sisters of Providence, had come from Canada six years earlier to work at Medford's new 85-bed Sacred Heart Hospital, what we now call Providence. World War I, originally known as the Great War, or the War to End All Wars, has ended, only to be succeeded by the Spanish flu pandemic. 
Join Sister Gerard and Sister Pascal and Dr. Elijah Pickle as they talk about the disease's impact on the Rogue Valley residents. I had a little bird. Its name was Enza. I opened the window and influenza. Oh, Sister Gerard, I am so tired of that ditty. It's only a week till Christmas. Perhaps you could sing a carol instead. I'm low on Christmas spirit, Sister Pascal. I saw in the paper where they've laid to rest wee Everett Laughlin in the Jacksonville Cemetery. Another victim of this, this bloody influenza. And the poor lad, only five years old. Well, at least there have been no new victims these past few days. Aye, let's pray Enza's leaving the valley. It's been heartbreaking, and the patients suffer so. With excruciating headaches, nosebleeds, lips and fingers turning blue, coughing so hard that ribs break. And many oh. die within 24 hours of exposure. Oh, I know. Even healthy people in the prime of their lives are, are struck down like they were shot. Aye, these past three months have been endless. And all because an infected soldier returning from the Great War got off the train in Ashland. Fortunately, though, when four cases of influenza were diagnosed in early October, the Good Sisters of Sacred Heart offered a floor of this very hospital to Mayor Gates to quarantine the flu patients. <laughs> Provided Medford had by the bedding, of course. <laughs> oh, it was a good thing. We had 25 cases within the next couple of weeks. And Mayor Gates was smart to close schools and public places and ban all social gatherings. Medford was the first Oregon city to do so. Oh. And requiring an influenza sign on the homes of the sick, that's helped too. Aye, it was fortunate he was so quick to heed the National Board of Health. We had a hundred patients ill with the flu in November. And we nursed entire families, many poor and sick in, as well. Oh, I know, but the quarantine did help. I mean, they were, the city was able to lift the ban long enough for us to celebrate the end of the Great War on Aye. November the 11th. Aye. And everyone was so looking forward to sharing the holidays with loved ones. Three, but the Spanish lady, she outwitted us. With all the soldiers returning home, Thanksgiving saw an immediate increase in new flu cases. Oh, I know. We've had 80 new pa patients since then. Aye. Reinstating the ban was necessary, but... Aye. Good afternoon, sisters. Oh. I thought I'd stop by and see how you're holding up. I see you're still making masks, Sister Gerard. Aye, I know this epidemic seems to be coming to an end, Dr. Pickle, but we did think that last month. And the masks have proven to be very effective, but very controversial. Yes, we've had no new cases this week, but we must stay very vigilant. The mask ordinance has been very controversial. When it first went into effect, downtown Medford looked like a fancy dress ball. <laughs> Women covered their faces with everything from handkerchiefs to bridal veils. Oh my <laughs> One man even put a mask on his horse. Yes. <laughs> People just don't realize how contagious this flu is. No. Why, do you know, I heard that four women were playing cards one afternoon, and the next day, three of them were dead. Oh my. Oh my. And That's one terrible. coughed or sneezed in the crowd, and we have 20 new cases. Yes, the city council had to explicitly state that the masks must cover both the mouth and the nose. And people found on the street without a mask have been arrested and given a $5 fine. Well, it is common courtesy to cough with one's mouth and nose when coughing or sneezing. Now, if only we could get the men to stop spitting. <laughs> Covering the mouth and nose is essential if we're to stop the spread of this darn flu. Excuse me, sisters. Business owners have opposed the quarantine and the mask requirement. But as city health officer, I have had to insist that all citizens must comply. Hmm. Mayor Gates says that people who oppose the masks simply feel themselves too dignified to, to wear them. Or they might value the almighty dollar above the saving of human lives. I've heard several merchants were arrested for not wearing masks in their own stores. And that business owners were incensed and even called the city oh. council Bolsheviks. Bolsheviks. <laughs> People are afraid. They don't understand what we're trying to do. We know that the flu is carried on water droplets, so smothering coughs and sneezes is very important. Well, I know the mask ordinance and the quarantine have certainly curtailed the number of cases we've seen. Yes. Sure. Dr. Pickle, do you know why it's named the Spanish flu? 
Well, I understand it's because Spain was a neutral country during the war and didn't censor its press. Other European countries prevented their newspapers from printing anything negative. But Spain printed the truth, so it has the dubious honor of having this terrible namesake. But the flu is no respecter of borders. Now, if we're r lucky and have no further cases, maybe they'll lift the, b the ban on public gatherings, maybe even the mask requirement by Christmas. Well, I must be on with my rounds. Nice to see you, sisters. Do try to get some rest. Oh, goodbye, Dr. Pickle. And thank you for checking in. Oh, if only it could be over by Christmas. Oh, let's pray for no new cases. Perhaps if we remind everybody of the most important preventions, you know, clean mouth, clean skin, and <laughs> clean clothes. You know, I've heard many people come up with things that they think will prevent the flu. Oh. Take castor oil, don't take castor oil. Exercise, rest. Don't worry, keep your feet warm. Inhale turpentine fumes and and wear a pouch containing asafetida around your neck. Asafetida? Well, it does smell like dirty socks. Aye, it does. I suppose it would at least keep people at a distance. Keep me at a distance. And you know, I read that a Portland woman was feeding her daughter onion syrup and covered her in raw onions for three days. I'm amazed the poor child survived. Well, you and Dr. Pickle have certainly put me in better spirits. I may sing a Christmas carol after all. Oh, that would be good. But later, I think, yeah, it's dinner time and we must see to oh. our patients. Oh, yes. Right. On December 23rd, the ban on public gatherings and the mask requirement were lifted. Enza had left the Rogue Valley. The worldwide epidemic lasted until 1920, but over half of the deaths occurred between September and December of 1918. During those terrible three months, the Sisters of Providence cared for over 150 patients, of whom only 12 died. The Spanish flu was one of the most deadly epidemics in history. During the Great War, more soldiers died of the flu than were killed on the battlefields. The, the uh, scientists estimate that the worldwide death toll was between 50 and 100 million people. That's like everyone that now lives on the West Coast. We've never had another epide epidemic like the Spanish flu, and we certainly hope we never will. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, please. I am John Obenshain. And I am Margaret Obenshain. But always I didn't like Margaret, so you could call me Peggy, please. You know, it's nice being here with you like this, Peggy, talking to these people. It seems like we've always been together. Actually, we almost really have. We were even born in the same year. And we are also first cousins. That is how we met. But don't tell anyone. <laughs> we heard people frown on this nowadays. Well, we first settled in Volta Court, Virginia, but we moved all over the place. We were in Indiana, and Illinois, and Iowa, and every place we went, we were dropping babies. V? <laughs> that didn't come out quite right. <laughs> we did indeed have a lot of children, ten. Can you imagine that? Of course, some died when they were very young, so we had to have more. We needed help with our farm. Well, we settled in Butte Falls, which is just west of Eagle Point. And uh, we had a very nice place there, about 100 acres. Not long after moving there, they finished the military road between Fort Klamath and Jacksonville, right by our house. So we turned our homestead into a stage stop. <laughs> they loved my good German sauerbraut and Wiener schnitzel, and we loved getting news from the area and making a little money. <laughs> yeah, we were always working. 
About this time I decided to stop being a farmer and to raise cows. Lots of cows. You can see why we needed the help. Our children did very well for themselves and for us. They became well-respected farmers, ranchers, and even inventors. Our son Bartlett and his wife Nancy outdid us with 12 children. <laughs> Nancy was always so proud of the fact that she was cousins with F.B. Morse, the inventor of the telegraph and the Morse code. Oh, but it was very exciting. But not as exciting as the adventures some of our boys had, especially Vaughn. His name was George Washington Obenchain, but we all called him Vosh. But there is a story here, but I will sit for this, for this story. We were having trouble with our cows. Something was riling them up. So Vosh got a couple of his brothers and horses and dogs and guns and went off to see what the problem was. What they found was a very large grizzly bear. One of the brothers shot it, but it just caused it to run off into the brush. Well, uh, Wash and his dogs went after it, and the dogs cornered it very quickly in a very small area, and Wash went in there and shot him with buckshot, and that just made the bear mad. And he turned around and attacked Wash with a vengeance. First thing he did was knock the horse out from underneath him, and then he pounced on top of him and started to tear him apart. Well, the dogs were trying to do their bit. They were attacking the bear from the backside, but it didn't seem to do any good for a while. Finally, the bear turned around to deal with the dog, and I think that saved Wash's life because his brother showed up about that time and shot the bear. It was a very big bear, 1,200 pounds. Its paw was 12 inches across wide. He's a very big bear. The doctor who was looking after Vosh said that he had 12 wounds, nine of which were serious. The most serious being one in which the bear bit through his leg. Yuck. Anyway, he took a while, but he was mended up as good as new, and I don't think he wants to see a bear for a while. But he did. Here's what the Jacksonville Times wrote a year later. Bosch Obenchain of Jackson County, who was badly scratched up by a grizzly bear. Scratched up? That's what it says here. Scratched up by a grizzly bear about a year ago, had a chase after a huge black bear which had killed one of his cows. In both instances, he succeeded in making meat of the Bruin. Eh? Our son's a bear killer. <laughs> Well, fortunately, life was always not that exciting. It was actually pretty calm, considering a lot of boys and a lot of cows. But we did very well. Yes, we did. The Oregon Sentinel published a column every year that listed Jackson County citizens who paid $2,000 or more in taxes. C.C. Beekman was always at the top. But we were on that list many times paying $5,000 in taxes. In 1879, that's a lot of cows. <laughs> we were always working. And the work was hard, and life was hard. But it was good. We even have a mountain named after us, Oban Chain Mountain between Eagle Point and Butte Falls. You should visit it sometime. And we thank you for stopping by to visit us today. And enjoy the rest of your afternoon, please. Guten Tag. Here's Tennessee soil. Sullivan County on the Virginia border. My wife Frances brought it out on the Oregon Trail. She must have known I'd be getting homesick. And I'm mighty grateful she done it. George Washington Acre, 1843 to 1920. That's me. 
farmer, soldier, railroad engineer, husband. Me and Francis was among the last of the covered wagon pioneers, 1895. We settled over near Phoenix. And between the two states, we raised eight children. Three of them here in Oregon. I mentioned soldier. What I didn't say is me and I, W. Thomas. Uh, he's back there in the Masonic section. We's the only known Confederate soldiers buried here in Jacksonville. Me? I mustered at Knoxville, July 8, 1861. Me and a bunch of other Sullivan County boys become Company K of the 3rd Tennessee Infantry of the Confederate States of America. And 13 days later, we found ourselves across the border at Manassas. First battle at Bull Run. It's there I seen General Jackson lead the 1st Brigade. We weren't part of his regiment, but I'd have been mighty proud. That's where he got his nickname, Stonewall. I got sick after that, in the hospital near two months. Remittent fever, they called it. I think y'all know it as malaria. I bet I survived, done pretty good too, till May 16th, 1864. We was attacking Yankee positions at Drury's Bluff, Virginia. And we was whooping them too. And I got captured. And them damn Yankees, they put me in one fort and then another and then in the hold of a ship bound for New Jersey. And lastly on a, a train for New York State. And I thought all that was bad. But then they introduced me to Helmira. <laughs> That's what we called it. Helmira. A Union death camp in Elmira, New York. That's what it was. No other word for it. It opened. July 6th, 1864. Suitable for maybe 5,000. But by end of August, they had over 9,000 of us in there. 132 already dead, and they was just getting started. And meanwhile, them townsfolk, they was paying to gawk at us from atop some observation tower some Yankee fella constructed across the street. It was a death camp. No other word for it. I'll tell you, no hospital to speak of. Sanitation nearly non-existent. We got our water from Foster's Pond and it was usually stagnant. For long, we was over 12,000 in there. And that's when that Yankee commander, where well, he done heard what happened down at Andersonville and some of them other Southern prison camps and decided to take it out on us. He cut our rations in half. And there weren't much to begin with. We had to catch and sell rats for five cents a piece. Oh, it was a thriving enterprise for some of us. Kept us from going mad. Folks familiar with them parts? They say it was the coldest winter they ever seen. And them Yankees, they never did get us proper shelter. Their own inspector called them on it at Christmas. 900 Confederates still in tents. Hundreds of men froze to death if starvation and disease didn't take them. I was one of the lucky ones. I got discharged March 10th, 1865. Just a month before General Lee surrendered. I had to take an oath to the Union. But, but I'd have done anything to get out of Helmira. 3,000 men never made it. One in four. I never spoke much about it with Francis. We married in 72. Raised a family, farmed, made our way out to Oregon. This ain't bad, I suppose. But Lord, I, I do miss Tennessee.
guests. Uh, bonjour, mesdames, messieurs. Uh, uh, welcome to my barber shop. Uh, I am Georges Champ, the proprietor, and this is my wife of ten years, Mariah. Hello to ye. I, we just celebrated our tin anniversary last night with our friends. Everyone brought us tinware gifts, some from Mr. Bilger's store down the way. Ah, we have big celebrations chez nous, our house we build at Oregon and First Street. And we enjoy some very fine wine. Oh, eh? And you surely did enjoy more than some. Mm. <laughs> well, everyone wished us a long and happy life together, and they promised to help us celebrate our silver and our gold wedding anniversaries. Oh, my share, you will not have to wait so long for gold. You shall have it from my mine oh, in Willow cool, Spring. Oh, uh, they, they say George. that it will be a bonanza of first magnitude. Sure, and I hope you find that bonanza soon. <sighs> You've been spending all your barbering money on that hole in the ground. Mm. Now, now become kind enough to come and tell these nice folks a little bit about yourself. I come from Alsace in France. I am barber in Cincinnati, Ohio, when Civil War begin. I join Union Army, where I am barber surgeon. I not just cut hair. Huh? I cut bad boil, uh, pool rotten tea, oh, and... George, they don't want to hear that. Oh. It was me brother, Matthew Dillon, who introduced us. You see, George was a soldier in with me brother. Ah, and one year later, I marry my beautiful Mariah. Ah, ta, George. What fiddles the <laughs> eye, fiddles the heart. Well, brother Matthew was a-wanting to come west. What? But we didn't come on the Oregon Trail, no. We came around Cape Horn in a <laughs> ship. Oh. It was 1871, mm. and a terrible, frightening journey it was, too. Oh, we survived the voyage, and uh, I buy Blackwell Barber Shop on California Street, uh, next door to where is Barber today. Uh, I advertise haircutting, shaving, shampooing, and ladies' hair cut to first-class style. And I have for you uh, dandruff lotion. <laughs> A miracle for cleansing scalp and restoring hair to vigor. Only one dollar per bottle. Yes, and ladies, if ye be wanting the very latest in hairstyle, ye must come to Georgia's shop. Uh, thank you, my dear, for your much help to my business. Well, the good Lord knows it hasn't always been easy. Um, George had to put up this simple sign because hooligans kept stealing his barber poles. Then, not just six months after opening the shop, was the fire of 1874. It started in that sinful El Dorado saloon next door, and it burned down the entire block, including the shop. Oh, but I rebuilt Tooth Sweet with bricks, and I put in bathtub for hot or cold baths. Oh, hot baths cost more, you know. Uh, it is much preferable to shave someone who bathed first. <laughs> and I share building with your brother's hole-in-the-wall saloon. Uh, good for my business, too. I fell ill, and as we had no children, a sweet girl, Ellen Barry, our young boarder, she took care of me as I lay dying. Hello, I lose my Mariah, but three years later, I marry Ellen. I find no gold, so I sell mine. Then I sell shop, and then I sell house. I sell house to lawyer Kolvik for $700. It's about $17,000 today, not much. Kolvik has son called Pinto, who becomes famous, Bozo the Clown. Mm -hmm. After I die, the fellow I sell mine to he finds the gold. <laughs> he get rich. He sell mine to a New York fellow who never find another ounce. C'est la vie, eh?
name is Judge James Neal, and I died when my house caught fire from a coal stove in December 1917. I was nearly 77 years old, living alone. My dear wife Minnie here had died nine years prior, and I was, I was maybe getting a bit feeble, but overall I was enjoying reasonably good health. Up until the end. Oh, the tragic death of a kind and popular man. Don't despair, friends. Despite my rather fiery demise, I lived a good life. Well, we both did, dear. Well, I did, and I saw it all. I came to Oregon on the Overland Trail. I fought the Modoc Indians, went to law school, became a judge, married the love of my life. So, you know, we'll share some of the highs and even a few of the lows of our life, and I, I think you'll agree that we really did live life to the fullest. Yes. I was born in Illinois in 1845. In 1853, I came across the plains. That was the same year James and his family right. set out. But sadly, my mother died along the way. She was buried in an unmarked grave, goodness knows where. I was just nine years old, an only child raised by my father. When I was born in Tennessee in 1841, and at age 12, my parents packed up me and my siblings for a new life out west. You can imagine, what an adventure, especially for a young boy. Well, they, they, they took on a land claim of 320 acres south of Ashland. Have you heard of Neal Creek? Named after my father. I went to local schools and graduated from Willamette University. And you know, I had an interest in the law, and so I was so fortunate to be able to study under James Fay, the most brilliant of pioneer lawyers. Passed the bar in 1865, married Minnie that same year, 1865. What a year to celebrate. Not just for us, for the whole country. That was the year the Civil War ended. And we moved to Jacksonville that same year. Right. James' practice was an instant success. Southern Oregon was beset by lawsuits and disputed claims. It seemed once the Indians were subdued, the need to cooperate among neighbors lessened. In bad times, folks stood side by side. In good times, they battled each other in law courts. James had no lack of clients, but James, you did more than practice law. Well, I always had a pension for public service, so I was so pleased to be elected prosecuting attorney for Jackson, Josephine Lake, and Klamath counties. Can you imagine all that territory? James traveled four counties on horseback. Then he was elected county judge and re-elected three times. They said his administrations were notably progressive. Well, I was a lifelong Democrat after all, and I ran on a platform of reform, and I promised the people that if elected, my first act would be the opening of all the books in the courthouse for complete transparency. James had an upright character and a kind demeanor. <laughs> when I was bedridden those last few years, James was my devoted caretaker. So good. Yeah, I'm not sure that all would share that same high opinion, dear. Uh, there was that murder case that got me into some hot water. Remember that John Justice fellow? Yeah. Well, he was accused of murdering his father. I was the defense attorney, and I was absolutely convinced that there wasn't sufficient evidence to try him. So I approached a few members of the grand jury in an attempt to persuade them to dismiss the case. I was caught, and I made a public confession. The grand jury, and later the Supreme Court, did find John Justice guilty. And then he was pardoned after a few years. So James, I think you were right about that case all along. Well, most of my cases are much more routine. Land disputes, estate settlements, even larceny. Like Thomas Godfrey, who was accused of stealing a hog. <laughs> yep, I heard it all. So I was successful in my public life, but equally so in my personal life. I married my sweetheart, and we had two fine sons, Frank and George. We did, and one Christmas Eve, we were blessed with our daughter, Monrovi. She died eight months later. Yeah, we lost our little girl, and then our son, George. Uh, he had a law practice right here in Jacksonville. He died at age 27. And then my darling Minnie left this earth before I did. We suffered losses, but there were so many blessings. Five grandchildren nearby, and just look around. Nature reminds us there is always a flower. I think you can probably tell my Minnie was a lover of nature, and she inspired others. Her character was really an uplift to us all. 
And after Minnie died, I, I lived alone in our home on, on North Oregon Street, even though my family felt I shouldn't be there by myself. But gosh darn it, I was doing just fine up until that fire. Then I went on to join Minnie. Oh, and it's probably time for all of you to go on too, but it's been so nice to have you visit. Thanks for coming. My door is always open. They'll be coming round the gravestones when they come. You want to smile? Oh, what the hell? Who are you? What are you curious about? What are you curious about? I'm frozen. I just wanted to ask you a question. Are you cold? No, I feel fantastic. I don't know if you're looking that way. Though. Being near you, being near you, Bill Miller, just warms my heart. By the way, are you cold? I'm just fine. I've got my lap robe, so I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Nice braids. Are you cold? Just a tad. <laughs> this might be the end of the video, and I know you'll hate this part. <laughs> the flying nun flies no more. I was wondering if you were cold. I am cold. <laughs> How about you? Are you cold? <laughs> yes, I'm cold. You guys are all dressed in black. I don't understand. Well, don't I look cold? Yeah. <laughs> well, Doctor, what Jeez. do you think of the, the evening here? Well, I'd say it's cold. <laughs> I'm visualizing hot butterscotch going right down the center of my head. Uh -oh. <laughs> and it works. What are, you, are, you, are you taking pictures or are you just... Yeah, I... I... Oh, are you cold? <laughs> yes. Freezing. Are you cold? Yes. <laughs> and guess what? You don't have to be dead anymore. Who says? My wife was on that bus. Are you cold? No. Yes, I'm cold. Get away from me. Are you cold? Oh, of course. <laughs> no. Are you cold? No, I'm not. What are you looking at?